All right, so at this time, I'd like to welcome Governor Mike Dunleavy and Governor Mark Gordon to the stage. I'm actually gonna move over and, and sit. So welcome. Um, it's, so, it's such a pleasure to have both of you here today and I really appreciate you taking the time out of both your busy schedules uh, to do this. And I think this will be a really interesting conversation that we can have. Um, both of you were elected in November of 2018, so you've both been in office the same amount of time. You represent two Western states in the United States. Um, there's many similarities, and so I, I guess I just wanna start by, you know, there's only, you're in such unique positions, there's only 50 of you that, ex that are in this, that get to have this position. You're basically the CEO of your respective states. You have a lot of say in the activities and governance. Um, and I think a lot of people here would be surprised at both the similarities and the differences between Wyoming and, and Alaska. So with that, Governor Dunleavy, talk to us about Alaska. It has a lot going for it, strengths. What should we know about it? Uh, well, as you know, I love talking about Alaska. Um, it's an incredible state. Uh, the, the strengths are, are many. It's um, as I mentioned yesterday or the day before, it's an Arctic and a Pacific nation. It's uh, America's only Arctic nation. Uh, we, are, we are, our proximity to Asia, uh, we are closer than any other state in the country, including Hawaii. We are eight to 10 hours by flight out of the Ted Stevens International Airport to just about every industrialized place in the Northern Hemisphere. We have enormous resources. Uh, we have the only super giant oil field in North America at Prudhoe Bay and Park. We have one seventh of the country's timber reserves and a very small timber uh, industry at this point. We have the two largest national forests in the country. Those two national forests, the Tongass and the Chug uh, Chugach, combined um, are larger than about eight or nine of our states in the United States, just those forests. Um, huge lead zinc deposits, Red Dog Mine up uh, north of the Arctic Circle by Kotzebue is one of the, if not the largest, lead zinc mine in the world. Lots of gold, lots of silver, copper, uh, some of the largest copper deposits. Uh, so our proximity to the world, uh, Billy Mitchell, uh, who was the, uh, they call him the father of the uh, Air Force for the United States, once said that if you turn the globe a certain way, as Angela had mentioned, uh, Alaska is really at the center of the world uh, in some respects. We have the second, large, second busiest cargo airport in the United States at Ted Stevens International. And Ted Stevens International Airport is also the fifth busiest cargo airport in the entire world because of our proximity on the globe. So our access to the Pacific Ocean, our access to our um, Asian neighbors, our resources, and uh, I would say a very friendly business climate. Uh, currently we are having discussions with different groups about extending a railroad from Canada to Alaska because of our access to the Pacific and the world. Um, and there are always, in, always groups, investors looking at Alaska in terms of investing for our resources, but also starting to look at our infrastructure as well. We're getting a lot of uh, activity and a lot of um, discussion going on about our international airport at the Ted Stevens International because again of its proximity and um, its, uh, its ability to transport goods all over the world. So, the Alaska has a lot going for it, and again, the, uh, the business-friendly climate that my administration has certainly brought in, uh, I think bodes well. And so, uh, if you're thinking about a place to invest, <laughs> it's America. It's governed by American laws, American tax law, corporate law, the stability of America, but we have the resources and the proximity that makes us a little different than a lot of other states. So, thank you. Thank you, Governor. I'm sure Wyoming can't compare, because I'm an Alaskan, too. But, Governor Gordon, I, I, uh, I, I, want to, we, I think we do want to hear about all the strengths Wyoming has as well as a state. Oh, well, well thank you. So we have the, the lowest population in the, in the country, which has certain strengths to it. Um, you know, when you talk about medical research, we have probably the most robust data set. Uh, people are um, part of the Wyoming health fair system, and about 75% of our population has a robust uh, profile uh, of, of blood work over the years. Uh, we have uh, set up a, a suite of about nine laws uh, to govern digital asset custody, uh, digital banking, 
a whole bunch of blockchain. Uh, there's a certain amount of utility tokenization and also obviously crypto. Uh, so we really have led the world uh, in, in many ways. It's kind of fun when you go places and uh, people from Singapore say, well, Wyoming's really out ahead, or people uh, from Malta have said that as well. So, so we're really trying to embrace the digital uh, revolution, but we also are the state that produces the most energy per capita in, in, in the country. And I've said this before, Angela, you've heard me. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that we often forget as we talk about this transition, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment or two, uh, to different forms of energy, is that regardless of what happens, uh, it's gonna happen in Wyoming. We have uh, the largest reserves of coal in, in, in the continental United States. Uh, we have the uh, seventh largest reserves of natural gas. Uh, we're third, uh, I think, in oil. Fourth in oil, sorry. Um, we have uh, uranium, uh, and we have the best wind resource in, in the United States. Um, so whatever happens is going to happen in Wyoming, and it's going to happen to us. Uh, so part of, I think our challenge is going to be how do we make it so that we actually steer that development. Three biggest sectors we have, obviously energy, energy number one. Number two, uh, tourism. Uh, we have the oldest national park in the country, uh, and number three, agriculture. And it was fascinating, we talked a little bit about that, about the work that we have done over the last couple of years in developing uh, carbon ranching. So uh, about 10 years ago, uh, sold car first carbon credits on the Chicago Climate Exchange, uh, and about 5.6 million metric tons. Uh, annually, uh, and so that's a market that is developing and growing, uh, and so we're really out in, the, in ahead on a number of ways. Thanks. Thank you. You know, Governor Dunleavy. You know, we t we talk a lot about the strengths, and and both of you have talked a lot about um, the resources that we have. And but, what do you think Alaska's greatest challenges are? That's a good question. So um, sometimes your strengths can also be at times weaknesses. Um, we are detached from the lower 48. We are a small state population-wise. And in many respects, we're a very new state. 1959 is when we came into the uh, union. And so we don't have a lot of infrastructure. The vast majority of our state is still wilderness. And um, the uh, uh, small internal market for anything that we would produce, we have about 730 to 750,000 uh, residents of Alaska. So I would say that uh, the small size of our state in terms of population and um, again, a new state, so we are, we are working and expanding our infrastructure, roads, bridges, railroads, ports. Um, I would say at this point is, um, is, is uh, so, some of our challenges that we're looking at. Yeah, I think, I, I think everyone here, in, in terms of how far so many people had to travel to attend this conference, um, helped really illustrate and bring home the point just how far north how far west, how far east uh, that we might be. So um, it's, it is definitely a challenge. Governor Gordon, Wyoming must have challenges too. So how do you see those? And I, and I know you had, some, you, you had some thoughts about that. Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Um, um, Wyoming is uh, landlocked. Uh, one of the challenges we have now is uh, getting our commodities to the coast. We've been blocked uh, by Oregon and by uh, Washington from getting access to Asian, Asian markets, which is a, a, a challenge for us, particularly when it, we talk about Powder River Coal. Powder River Coal has the lowest sulfur content, and uh, by Washington's own analysis, if we were to burn Powder River Coal in Asia, we would reduce carbon emissions by about 20% over five years. Uh, and yet the, the notion is let's not develop coal, let's, uh, let's, let's make sure that uh, we, we push a, a renewable portfolio. Um, so one of our challenges is access to markets is one of the reasons it's nice to be here. Um, I, I know we've talked about rail access to the Pacific, uh, and it would be nice to have a friendly state that, that we could work with. We have an aging population. A lot of military folks come to Wyoming to retire. We're very uh, friendly for military purposes. Um, we have no income tax. Uh, we have uh, a, a wonderfully robust um, 
uh, school system. Uh, we have, uh, it's a requirement of our constitution that every student get exactly the same education, same funding level, same basket of goods across the, the scope. So we have a lot of neighboring states that, uh, that, that are doing, people are doing business in the other state, but they're living in Wyoming because we have better special ed, we have better education, we have better teacher pay. So this is a challenge for Wyoming going forward to be able to maintain that. Um, but I think, you know, in, in each of those challenges, there's also opportunity. I think if people begin to recognize the, the value uh, that an open landscape, that long migration corridors for wildlife provide, we begin to understand that uh, it isn't a question of should we be all renewable and no fossil, but it is a question of how do we build a portfolio that goes forward that makes the most sense for the country. You know, that, that's a, that is such a topical discussion about how we manage going forward and this balance between fossil fuel development, the recognition that we're going to continue to need fossil fuels by all the estimates I've seen, even from climate action networks, that we're gonna to continue to need fossil fuels over the next 50 years. Fossil fuels are clearly very important um, in that development. Governor Dunleavy, how, how should we as Alaskans and in the rest of the world think about that natural resource development? One of the things that we noted is that the retreating glaciers are happening and they can leave behind very rich resources, mineral wealth behind as well. How do we, how do we responsibly think about that? And, and I'd be curious to hear from you how you're, how you're thinking about that resource development. Thank you. So as we know, things are changing very rapidly. I mean, very rapidly. I think um, I'd read somewhere at one time that uh, from the time of Alexander the Great, which was 300 some BC to about 580, the fall of the Roman Empire, technology changed very little, so much so that in the last 20 years, there were more technological advances than there was in that hundreds and hundreds of uh, almost a thousand year period of time. So we know things are changing rapidly. Um, we have to be nimble. We have, to, um, we, have to, we have to look ahead. We have to constantly be anticipating what's going to be the next move. Um, you've all read the stories that uh, some estimate that this generation being born today will never own a car, that the uh, cars will be you know, uh, auto-driven, automatic. Uh, there'll be no garages, no insurance. Everything will be on an app. You want a car, you press the button, out front's your car. You leave the car to go to your house, and the car is gone. So we have to take all of these things into consideration. Um, Whatever we do w along the lines of energy, and a lot of our funds here today, including the permanent fund, is, um, is underwritten by our resources, in our case mainly oil, is that whatever the, the, the primary um, resource is, you, we're still going to have to generate electricity because it's going to become more of a digital world, more of an electrical, electrically tied in world. But we have to be careful that we don't leave upwards of 2 billion people behind that currently don't have electricity. We have to make sure that wherever we go, that those costs for this energy is affordable to everyone. And the concerns, and I know I was talking with uh, a governor from Wyoming, the concern is that currently our resources, oil, coal, gas, uh, to some extent in lower 48 and other countries, nuclear, is really, really what drives our electrical generation. We just have to be careful that we don't make that so costly and view those resources as so onerous that we are no longer utilizing those resources and, and switching to a higher cost model, let's say uh, wind or solar. Everything has a cost. Everything has a benefit. And so um, the hope is that as we talk about carbon and we talk about the, the warming, um, uh, the warming uh, uh, world, warming Arctic, warming Alaska, is that um, we look at potentially expediting the research and the uh, development of cap carbon capturing methods. So as opposed to abandoning these fossil fuels to generate electricity, I, I really think the focus ought to be, and I know to some extent there are investors looking at it, how do you capture the carbon so that we can still use oil, coal, and gas and don't have to necessarily switch to a higher, uh, higher cost model? The warming of the Arctic and warming of Alaska, um, I, I think there's no doubt that warming is happening. And as Angela mentioned, we do have glaciers retreating. I flew over in a uh, helicopter to a mine site close to here in Haines, Alaska earlier this week. And you can see evidence of that. But as, she, as Angela mentioned, you can also see as the, as the uh, glaciers recede, 
it's opening up opportunities for more minerals, for example, and other resources. The Arctic is the same way. Um, the Arctic, some consider uh, Alaska, our, our close proximity to Asia again, as a, uh, the Northern Sea Route, uh, a possible competitor to Panama if things keep melting at this rate and things keep warming. Um, so there's plenty of challenges, but this world has always been, been faced with challenges. And there's always people that are saying, you know, this could be the end or this could be a problem. We always seem to overcome it with technology and ingenuity. And I think that's what we have to apply in this case, probably even more so because things are changing so rapidly. Governor Gordon, did you wanna did you wanna add anything to those um, comments? Well, sure. Yeah. No, I think uh, Governor Dunleavy uh, has made a very good point. Uh, it, it is interesting at this juncture in our in our existence that uh, there's a certain amount of cognitive dissonance that we live with. Uh, give you an example: uh, impossible foods. Um, uh, you, you know, the notion you can grow um, uh, meat out of a petri dish. And, and so we're very excited about that. It's disruptive. We talk about it all the time. And at the same time, we don't like GMO foods. Um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, something that is engineered and grown versus something that is engineered and grown. Uh, and, and they both seem uh, somehow to, to sort of fall into this interesting place of cognitive dissonance. I think the same thing is true with, with what we've done with renewable standards and renewable uh, energies. Y you know, the argument is we need more renewables, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. The issue is carbon in the atmosphere. Um, so again, there's a posture that's been taken but the issue is not being addressed. And so in Wyoming, one of the things we're doing is uh, drafting a piece of legislation, just asked for it the other day, that says uh, we want a percentage of every new electric generation to have a carbon negative footprint. So how do you do that? In other words, let me just restate that. It's not just reducing our carbon dioxide emissions, it's reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we're going to put a law in place that says that's what you have to do if you're going to generate electricity in Wyoming. So how do you do that? And the, and the way you do that is with uh, incorporating a certain amount of biomass in your uh, coal burn. So you have a, a new technology called BECCS uh, that uh, can take some of our dying forests, and anybody who thinks that a dying forest isn't uh, a carbon source, a carbon dioxide source, has got another thing coming. You really have to address forest management. You have to be able to combine those things with carbon capture and sequestration to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and address the urgent need for climate change to be, uh, to be dealt with. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that I think uh, this forum can provide, is a perspective to look at how uh, disruptive technology should be judged and to think about it in a larger context than just what is publicly popular. So there we are. <laughs> Thank you. You know, that, that sort of helps me um, because one of the things that I've been thinking about, you both come from rural states. I think we have a slide maybe that has some numbers on it in terms of population and, and, and federal land percentages and um, it, I, I'm not sure if if uh, that slide comes up or not, but you know we've been talking a lot the last couple of days about digital disruption, the impact on jobs, business, economies, and you both lead rural states. Um, they're flyover states. We talk about flyover states. Alaska could be a, considered a flyover state if you're flying from. Those of you who flew Seattle to Dubai or Dubai to Seattle, you flew right over Juneau. Um, and how do you think about that impact of disruption on your on your state and, and keeping people employed and, and jobs and all of that? Well, again, you have to, uh, uh, in our case, we have to play to our strengths now, but also be looking at the future. Um, we, are, we are a flyover state. Folks land at our international airport mainly because they're going somewhere else, and it's our proximity on the globe again. But um, a, a, again, as we look, we, we, have to, um, we have to rethink our educational systems, for example, so that we're looking ahead and we're, we're making sure that our young people are learning how to think independently and solve issues independently. 
come up with creative ideas on how to attack issues, as we mentioned, uh, carbon capture, for example. Um, they're going to see a world that um, we, we can only imagine. I mean, my father, who passed away at the age of 93 in 2012, he was, uh, when he was a young man, they were still using horses to pull uh, wagons through the city of Scranton to pick up uh, certain things like trash. And uh, he was alive to see people get on the moon um, and technologies that he would have never even thought about. It's going to happen even more rapidly. So in the case of Alaska, I say uh, we play to our strengths. Uh, we keep an eye on what's happening with the Arctic and, uh, and plan our strength there for potential uh, 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 Alaska being a transport uh, through the Arctic from Europe and Asia to other parts of the world uh, through the Arctic. We, um, we, we work with others on the cutting edge of capturing carbon. We, um, we recognize that uh, we are going to have to really be wired in Alaska, because we are remote, so that we could be part of the international community in terms of digital, uh, digital approaches to digital. And so it's always thinking a step ahead as opposed to right now and today. And so that's part of what my administration is talking about, is how can we invest in the future, invest in the head, because the future is really right now. It's happening so rapidly. So for states like ours, we rely on our resources, but we also have to be part of this new century of uh, new way of thinking, new innovations, and new technology. We're just going to have to do it. Do you want to take that one? Otherwise, I, could, I have another question for you, otherwise, <laughs> Governor Gordon. Okay, sure. Because you, you kind of talked about the disruption, but one of the things that always strikes me about this slide is the percentage of federal lands that both states have. And I think what a lot of people, especially in this room, um, might be surprised by is that the states don't necessarily have autonomy over 100% of their lands. And especially as, as you move west in the United States, more and more of the land becomes more, has more federal ownership, which means more federal control. How do you um, coordinate? Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the federal government and how how we should think about that, and does it impact us as investors uh, in your states? Um, and yes, I, I, I think it does. Um, so, so Wyoming has a large percentage of federal lands. You can see the numbers. Uh, you can see the numbers there. About 50% of our, of our lands are federally uh, under some sort of federal control. Some of that's national parks. Some of that's Department of Defense. A lot of it is U.S. Forest Service, and a lot of it is Bureau of Land Management. Uh, it, it's a challenge to get anything done, and depending on what administration's in office, you have um, massive swings uh, that don't give the state to be a, a much of a chance to be able to to address those those concerns uh, that might arise. And I'll give you an example: endangered species. Uh, right now, we have uh, grizzlies that have been um, on on the rise. Populations exceeded their targets. Uh, we have uh, grizzlies in the Montana that are uh, 30 miles off of where their designated habitat should be. We had a judge who woke up one uh, evening la or woke up one morning uh, last year in Cody, downtown Cody, Wyoming, and had a grizzly on his back porch. Uh, we have farmers that now have grizzlies in their in their uh, cornfield. Kind of adds a little dimension to the corn maze. Uh, uh, but um, you, you know, and, and at this point, there's a real struggle publicly with the notion that grizzlies are are are, are wonderful animals, which they are. Um, but they also eat people. So we've had the highest number of uh, hunter incidents over the last couple of years, and we are precluded from being able to take a state management approach um, just because uh, of the public dimension of that, of that conversation. Same thing is true uh, when it comes to developing public lands or um, actually any kind of management initiative. Uh, these are challenges, and when you think about it, um, uh, as, as a great nation that has the ability to get a lot of stuff done on a rapid basis. Um, NEPA, which is an act I worked hard to pass, uh, has, has in many ways become so cumbersome that if you're going to do anything at this time, if you're going to do anything, it is going to take you a decade or more, if it's of any substance, to get done. And by that time, the economics of that project are going to have changed. So it really is time that as a, as a nation we come to grips with what that, with what that means and, and try to figure out ways to reform 
uh, these wonderfully landmark laws that were well-intentioned and well-engineered, well, well but have over the years uh, a body of law behind them with legal decisions that have made them really crippling for our economy going forward. Uh, thank you. Just uh, So Alaska has the same challenges with the federal government. We were a territory. And when we received, a, we became a state, we had to agree to a couple, couple stipulations. And the long and short of it is that um, the majority of land in Alaska is controlled by the federal government, whether it's BLM land, park land, uh, uh, preserve. You have a big national forest here. Um, the, the issue is that you, when you have individuals within the bureaucracy that want to continue with a um, preservation mentality in states like Alaska, Wyoming, Nevada, and others, uh, you get this overreach happening. So, for example, this Tongass National Forest, which we're now in, we're in now, located in, it, um, it's supposed to be a multi-use forest for timber, for mining, for tourism. Uh, under past administrations, individuals working within the bureaucracies have tried to tighten that up to where it's almost become a park, which is, was never the intent. So what we do in Alaska is we constantly remind the president um, and we're fortunate because, again, the International Airport in Anchorage is where the president stops when he goes to Asia, so I have an opportunity to go and talk with him on Air Force One. Constantly remind the president and his people that Alaska is a resource-based state. It, uh, it, part, part of the way the uh, Constitution is configured demands that we uh, develop our resources to provide a tax base and jobs for people, and that the overreach by some within uh, previous administrations and maybe a handful now really do impact the state of Alaska, not just on federal land, but for example, EPA can also impact what you do on state land. We're very, very fortunate though um, that we do have an administration right now that is very pro-development, that is very focused on making sure that unnecessary actions or regulations on the part of the bureaucracy don't impede our ability to develop our resources and create jobs uh, across this country. So Alaska has benefited from this administration and um, we work closely with it to open up, try and open up our forests and try and open up our mining lands. Uh, uh, Anwar, for example, you've heard of Anwar, that was closed off for oil uh, development or exploration forever until this administration came on board and worked with our federal delegation and others to open up Anwar. So we're seeing a, um, a, a renewed uh, uh, resurgence in hope that we will be able to capitalize on these political moves and they'll manifest themselves for Alaska into wealth creation because that's what we're all about. That's what often, as I mentioned earlier, underwrites your funds is resource wealth. And so all we're trying to do is, is work with folks in the federal government to get them to understand what Alaska is all about and that we can both have protected lands and development, kind of a happy medium in which everyone benefits. But it's a, it's a constant exercise. It just doesn't happen naturally. You know, I'm going to I'm going to stick with you, Governor Dunley, because you you brought up the underpinnings to how sovereign wealth funds are initially seeded, funded. What do you believe the the role of sovereign wealth funds should be for for states and and for for sovereigns? Well, again, uh, we're we're blessed with the Alaska Permanent Fund, um, and it, every Alaskan is aware of the Alaska Permanent Fund. I'm not sure in your states or your countries if every citizen is aware of your sovereign wealth fund. But in Alaska, it's talked about constantly. It's looked at constantly. It's, um, it's protected. There are attempts to get uh, politicians to get their hands into it. So it's always on the front page. Um, the, uh, the, resource, the concept of the permanent fund, and Angela is probably, you know this better than I, is, um, is to preserve non-renewable wealth for future generations in Alaska. So when gold, oil, lead, zinc, especially oil, is gone, that wealth that was taken out of the ground continues to create more wealth and new wealth within the fund. And uh, I have to say, most Alaskans um, understand that. You could go to a store, you can go to a mall, you can see a man on the street anywhere in Alaska, and you can ask them, have you ever heard of the Alaska Permanent Fund? The chances are, they'll all say yes because it is something that we value, it is something that we're aware of. The, um, the, it makes a lot of sense to have a fund like this. It makes total sense because you would burn through that non-renewable resource pretty quick. And we can look at history and we've seen examples of that in other resource uh, producing locales in which once the resource played out, 
there was no investment, there were no jobs, you end up with ghost towns and you end up with uh, populations leaving. We're very fortunate and um, you have a difficult job, as I mentioned in the opening uh, talk I had with you uh, uh, earlier this week, to keep the uh, temptations of politicians from changing your fund to make it more accessible for politicians' desires at that moment. This should be a long-term investment that grows long-term, that benefits long-term. So um, I, I actually prepared a couple of slides that I'd love, if there's a way to put them up, I thought I'd run through them quickly. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, the governor and I have uh, been speaking for the last uh, couple of days just about the challenges going forward and how you, what you do with a, with a, um, with, with a sovereign fund. So uh, just, just to point out that we have mountains too and it's beautiful. Uh, this is the Wind River Range. Um, I'm hoping this goes the right way. Um, just for those of you who didn't know, and I, my friends are from New Zealand, I just want to point out that Wyoming preceded you by about a month in offering women, uh, the, the, actually recognizing women's votes. This was the very first woman to vote, uh, Louisa Swain, um, continuously were the most first organized government that did that. So just, just wanted to point that out uh, to my good friend Matt. Um, <laughs> The evolution of our funds really goes back to statehood of eight, uh, in 1890. Um, so we, the United States had come out of the Civil War. There was a real prohibition against uh, uh, owning capital stock because the way you did uh, economic development back in the day was you invested in railroads. And then the Civil War came along and everybody lost their investment. So our Constitution prohibited owning any kind of capital. It said capital stock. Uh, and, and then um, we uh, uh, went forward with basically a buy and hold bond platform. And in 1968, there was $80 in our state's checkbook. Um, the governor at that time, Stan Hathaway, thought it would be pretty important to do something. We imposed a severance tax uh, for and passed the 1974, we passed our permanent mineral trust fund. That is now about a third of our total portfolio. But from statehood, there were a number of other permanent funds that were established to support education, support the state hospital, uh, and, and so on. Uh, in 1996, uh, we, we allowed for the funds to start to own stocks. Uh, it was set at 50% at the time. Uh, Cynthia Lummis addressed one of your first conventions. Um, she addressed you $4.58 billion. We've grown, and then what I want to say and, and thank you all for is the opportunity to work uh, with so many of these funds, New Zealand in particular, on really setting up a new governance structure. Uh, and it's very important because we recognize that a lot of our fossil assets back maybe four years ago, we realized some of those could be stranded. And that future aspect of the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund actually had a role to play in transitioning our economy as it went forward. This is the stuff that I guess I'm talking about. Yes, this was the energy transition. So natural gas faces the same fate as coal. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute has indicated that uh, the cost of building a gas-fired power plant now exceeds what would happen with renewables, so you shouldn't build gas-fired power plants. I put these pictures up reference point just so that we understand what we're talking about. That's a solar field, obviously. That's a dense wind field. And this is one of the places where those windmills are going to go. That's a place called Elk Mountain. You can see it's a beautiful vista. There's a lot of elk that go through there. That kind of development affects that population. So I think there are trade-offs. But the challenge for us going forward, uh, really, and I hope that sound comes on for this, uh, the challenge really comes in this next slide. Hello? Honey? Uh, are you at the club? Yes. <laughs> I'm at the mall now and I found this beautiful leather coat. It's only a thousand. Can I get it? Well, sure, if you like it that much. Okay, um, I also stopped by the Mercedes dealership and saw the new model. You know, the one I really How like. How much? 120. 
Well, at that price, I want it with all the options. Great! Oh, and, and one more thing. The house we wanted last year is back on the market. They're, they're asking 1.5. We'll make them an offer. But come in at uh, 1.4. <laughs> okay. I love you, baby. I love you, too. Okay, bye. Um, does anybody know whose phone this is? So, so uh, obviously, thanks to Postbank for that. Um, you, you, but, but uh, you know, this is a time when we, as 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 sovereigns, have the opportunity, really, to cooperate with one another, uh, to to sort of set a course forward, to understand how transition works, and to make sure that we don't necessarily, you know, one of the things that's problematic with with uh, disruption. Uh, you know, Amazon is a great place, very convenient, but has put most of our small mom and pops in Wyoming out of business. Uh, and, and the carbon footprint of the returns, which have tripled, uh, now you, you, you've, got to, you've got to wonder about that. So I think, you know, as sovereigns, um, and I'll just go to what my point here was, um, as, as sovereigns, I think this is an opportunity to uh, put together what I'm going to casually recommend as Juno principles so that, you know, we can define disruption as a tool for good rather than just saying disruption is good. Thank you for that. No, and thank, and thank you for, for all, of, all of those comments and how to think about that. And both of you um, alluded to it. You talked about it. You talked about politics and, and keeping politics out of the fund. And so... How how are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to th how are we supposed to think about all of that? Because we work in a political world, and by definition, there's a lot of interested parties. So how should we um, work with you to do some of these things? Because I know I know from our peers in the audience there that they struggle under those same um, tensions in a lot of ways. So how do we say no to you? I'm still reeling from the, the uh, cell phone, thinking, um, looking for my cell phone and making sure it's not laying on a table here. Um, so you have to say no, that's, it's, and that's, that's really important. I mean, um, you have to, uh, who's ever overseeing the funds, whether it's a nation or a state um, or some other entity, has to set it up so they, they look into the future and they have to assume there will be constant pressure on that fund by politicians. There'll be constant pressure on that fund by politicians to either uh, have a better return that goes somewhere somehow to a political uh, a cause, a big infrastructure project, uh, a massive dam, or this or that, um, or somehow gets spent some other way. So the idea is to set this up, in my opinion, as independently as possible, enough, you know, enough of a relationship with the government, but distant enough that it allows you to invest prudently according to principles. That's what should happen. Um, I know that there are countless stories of, of funds being either tapped into or major attempts to tap into those funds to take care of, quote, emergencies now. Um, in my opinion, that, that, that begins, that's the beginning of the end, potentially, for a fund to perform as it, uh, as it was set up to do. So. Um, even our permanent fund corporation right now, uh, the discussion on how do we pay for our government? Do we tax ourselves? What portion of the permanent fund do we use? Where does the permanent fund dividend play in this in the future? Um, what happens if we get less and less royalty? How do they invest? There's constant pressures even on this fund here in Alaska. So um, again, the, the fund should be set up uh, to, to run as independently as possible keeping a relationship with the sovereign or whoever is in, who's over uh, for the purpose of for who that fund is for, but you just have to be constantly looking for ways and anticipating ways that politicians are going to try and access that fund and try and insulate yourselves as much as possible with friendly politicians or those that have some ability to, um, to keep that uh, insulating, uh, insulating wall, firewall between uh, your investment side of things and the political side of a government. 
Well, in, in, in our case, uh, we have many of the same, uh, of the same challenges, uh, and um, fortunately, uh, thanks to the work of this, uh, this forum, we were able to make connections with a number of you and, and kind of understand best practices. So what we did uh, about uh, four years ago was to establish an investment board, and it, we call it the Investment Funds Committee, uh, that is chaired by an elected uh, officer, the treasurer, who is here at the conference. There are five constitutional offices in Wyoming, and as Tony Blair once said, uh, you, you know, you don't always pick uh, the best politician to run the fund. He said it's a little bit like trying to pick your football coach at a big match. Uh, that guy has a, a lot of uh, opinions and he sure is loud. He must know what he's doing. Uh, so what we did is we said, let's have each of the electeds put together a, um, a, a member that they would put on a selection committee. Then we qualified the people that are going to serve on that investment funds committee. They have to have seven years of institutional investing practice. They also have to have, uh, port to have done that with portfolios of 500 uh, million or more. Uh, and then they come together and they help advise the board, which is us, uh, on, on uh, asset allocation, et cetera, et cetera. And we did that to get the double arms length uh, protection from the political process that is New Zealand's model. Uh, and it seems to have worked. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges with, with um, political leadership is that it changes. And one of the great things about this model is when uh, Treasurer Meyer came on board, he was able to pick up uh, and put his own stamp on exactly what was going on, but with a continuity that made the fund go forward well. The challenge comes with our legislature. So then what we've done with that is to uh, make sure the legislature is literate about what the, uh, our permanent funds do. So we're different from most uh, other funds in that we have uh, about 10 different funds in our portfolio. Each of them has a unique asset allocation, and we do that because you know, our future fund can really take a lot more risk than our uh, workers' compensation fund or our general fund. Uh, and, and so we make sure that our legislature understands what the returns are. Uh, we make sure that the legislature weighs in on how much risk, because every legislator likes to have lots of return but don't lose any money, thank you. And, and, and so we've said, you know, Here's the scenario plan. Um, how much risk are you, how much are you really willing to lose? And, and here's what it's going to do to the return. Now, mind you, all of these funds make up about a third. They're the, I think two years ago was the first most important revenue source to Wyoming. So all of these funds make up a third of our general fund budget. We don't give a dividend. We just give you good government, um, <laughs> which has its own problems. Um, <laughs> So then it becomes a little bit easier to tell the politicians, look, if you're going to go borrow from this fund and give us a 1% return or less than that, you're putting a drag on its earning capacity. We're still working on that, but I'm hopeful that they will begin to understand. Uh, and, and I think that's what we have to do. We have to build rules. We have to build the respect for the rules. Um, and, and it's a real challenge, especially when those chief sources of revenue, oil, coal, and gas, are on decline. You know, one of the things I'm gonna do is, is switch gears. We have an international crowd here, and nationally, here in the United States, there's been more volatility and political division than ever before, or at least than I've seen. Um, we have a big presidential election coming up next year. We have 35 U.S. Senate seats open, plus the entire House of Representatives. Um, 35, for those of you counting, it's 33 plus two special seats. You're both Republicans, so I don't have a Democratic governor sitting up here next to me that can, that can weigh in, but how should this group think about what's gonna happen in this country next year in that, that election? Um, governor Gordon, you and I were in Auckland when President Trump was elected, and it was interesting to be in a foreign country with all of you at that time and the reactions that we saw. How should we think about um, 2020 and, and what's facing us uh, in that front? It's gonna be interesting, isn't it? 
Um, it's going to be real interesting. Um, I think what you're going to see played out in 2020 is the future of both the Democrat and the Republican parties going forward. I think we're at a crossroads. Um, it was uh, just a few years ago that um, you would not, uh, you would not, if you were a mainstream candidate, be talking about socialism in the United States, not just abstractly, but literally putting plans forward to begin the process of having this country march towards the concept of socialism. Um, at the same time, um, the, uh, the current president, President Trump, who's re running for re-election, is, um, is, is cut from a different cloth, is a different, uh, a different, whole different uh, uh, example of a president uh, when it comes to parties and when it comes to conventional thinking. There's no doubt about it. It's, America's, America's at a crossroads. Um, again, as we're talking about uh, carbon, uh, carbon issues of carbon and resource development and oil, gas, and coal, and, and um, what is this country and thus potentially what is this world going to look like? Um, it's, um, you're going to see that battle played out. You've ha you haven't seen that battle played out now the last couple of years, and I think you're going to see it intensify. Um, will we elect somebody? who believes that in 10 years we can be 100% carbon free? Are we going to elect somebody who believes that uh, we still need to redevelop our, our carbon-based resources and create jobs and create wealth in that manner? Um, what, is, uh, what is healthcare going to look like for, for Americans? What is um, education going to look like for Americans? It's all happening right now. It's real time. And what you're seeing unfold is going to be, to, some, to a great extent, uh, the future. Not just the president, as Angela said, but uh, congressmen and women and senators are up. So really, it's going to be, um, it's going to be an interesting look. As, as America becomes more urbanized, our traditional, our 200-plus-year-old institutions, such, such as the uh, Electoral College and other, other um, uh, uh, institutions such as that, are going to be challenged as well because more and more the certain political philosophies are concentrating in our urban areas, where our rural areas are going on a whole different path. So it's, it's gonna be a fascinating, and I think um, we always talk about elections, this election is gonna be the most important. I think this election is probably going to be one of the, if not the most important, to setting the future for this country for some time. Uh, yeah, I would, I would very much agree with that. It, it's interesting. Uh, there's always been this notion, supposedly Winston Churchill said something about how if you were young and not a liberal, you had no heart, and if you were old and not a conservative, you had no brain. Turns out polling data d indicates that millennials have voted in a bigger uh, consort the last uh, two elections than they ever have before. Uh, they split the vote uh, two years, three or four years ago uh, by uh, going for a number of third party candidates. And in this country, there are two major parties, as you know. Um, and that group uh, theoretically now has understood that splitting out your vote is maybe not a way to cause change. So there is a potential for a fairly large tsunami. Uh, to, to come on board, and, and as Governor Dunleavy says, um, you, you know, that's a consort that, that the notion of owning a car is not a particularly important notion. Um, and, and, and also, just a whole different framework. I, you, know, you know, our cell phones now deliver all kinds of stuff. There's a different currency that we use to buy stuff uh, on, the, on the internet now. Um, but, but we don't necessarily have to own it. We're much more interested in subscriptions. So you're really seeing a fundamental shift, I think, in potentially the economy. Uh, and I think you're also seeing potentially a real challenge in, in how we govern. So the nice thing about being a governor is that all of that plays out at the national level. And, and we have built ourselves into a wall, so the only way I can win is if the other person loses. It doesn't matter what the issue is, I'm just gonna try to crush the opposition. And that's what's going on nationally. But if you look at what's happening with governors, you have the ability to work across the aisle to begin to talk about regional economic development, which is what's exciting about being here, 
uh, that Governor Dunleavy and I have so many uh, opportunities in common, and so you know, how can we cooperate and be able to build that? I have the same relationship with Governor Polis to a degree, who is from the other faith. And uh, Governor Polis, um, uh, you, you know, w was elected on a dramatically different platform than I did, and yet we have issues in common that we have to deal with, dealing with the federal government, making sure that our farm produce can get to market, uh, making sure that our economy and our people grow. So, so at this time, and I don't mean to get too philosophical about this and apologize for being too long, it is fascinating what happens at a global scale with our cell phones. You can tweet and reach anybody. The news is absolutely everywhere, and you can pick whatever news you want to hear. You can do with CRISPR, you can change life. We are becoming God. And so where do you feel comfortable? It comes back down to the lowest levels at the state and at the community level. And we need to really strengthen our governing models at that level uh, in order to be really successful going forward. Thank you, Governors. Um, I do want to make sure we leave some time for questions and get and get Mike Runners uh, put in place. But so I'm going to ask both of you one final question before we open it up to the audience. Um, we're all investors in this room. We're always looking for opportunities, and while we have amongst ourselves an, a no sale rule. I'm going to give each of you the opportunity about one initiative or project or concept you absolutely want us as investors to take a look at in your state. Now, we're not looking for term sheets today. Uh, just something that we should be aware of that, that you, you want to, uh, this, is your this is your opportunity. Well, thank you. So um, we have a lot of folks uh, internationally here, which is good. First, I would say that America is a good place to invest. Um, it, it, notwithstanding the uh, issues of you know, the election coming up, generally speaking, this, this is a safe place to invest your money. This is a safe place to get a return. There were, uh, there were changes to the tax law a couple years ago that I think it makes it even, um, even better for outfits to invest in, this, in, the, in the country. So why look at Alaska? Um, you know, the governor and I joke around a lot. He's got a fantastic state. It's a small state population-wise, but it does a lot in that small state. And um, I, I have to commend you in Wyoming. Uh, how do, what do you call somebody from Wyoming? A Wyomingite. An, a Wyomingite uh, for, for doing a terrific job in that state. Um, I'd say take a look at Alaska for a whole host of reasons. Um, we have our traditional resources. We're a new state. So imagine America, in some respects, 100 years ago in terms of resources, in terms of uh, infrastructure. But also think of us now in terms of 50 years from now, our proximity on the globe, our, our closeness to China. We are approximately 2,000 plus miles closer to China than California or the state of Washington is. Um, our international airport hub is getting more and more investment because they realize that that is the place to stop, transport goods, et cetera. Um, the Arctic is warming. 50 years from now, if this trend continues, there will be, if not uh, seasonal, there will be regular transport through the Northwest Passage. It's Alaska. America's right there. Um, so between our resources, our vast resources that are, in many respects, just barely <laughs> being touched, our international location, our proximity on the globe, and our access to the world, the governor talked about how the political climate in the lower 48, and to an extent in Canada, especially on the coasts, are constraining the ability to ship goods, it's especially your resource-based goods, across their lines. This has become such, a, such an issue that we have groups from Canada and the lower 48 talking to Alaska about extending a railroad to Alaska because we have free access to the Pacific Ocean and the world. We have proximity to Asia. Um, we have great infrastructure. What little we have is great. We've suffered two major earthquakes. In 2002, I think it was, was a 7.0, and on November 30th, it was a 7.1. No deaths. There was some damage to some roads, but the pipeline and the ports, and the, they all held. So we, we can engineer for those events. Um, and you have right now a government in Alaska that is very much pro-investment, pro-development, procreation of wealth. So coupled with what's happening in America as a whole in this administration and with the tax codes, 
our stability, Alaska's proximity and resources, and our desire to get more investment in the state of Alaska, I would ask you to take a look at that. And we have folks that would be willing to talk uh, with you and others um, in, your, uh, in your country or state. Well, thanks. And, you know, as, as Governor was talking about it, again, Alaska is a wonderful state as well. I think both of us, in fact, I think the western part of the United States is, is particularly uh, blessed to have people who are accustomed to solving problems. Uh, you know, when an when a, when a earthquake happens, or in our case, uh, maybe a forest fire or something, the people step forward and try to make the best of it. They um, are filling sandbags, they're getting shovels going out trying to do what they can. This is a culture that understands that you have to put your shoulder to the wheel. You can't just sort of wait for the federal government to show up and solve all your problems. Uh, so you've really got a can-do atmosphere uh, in, in the West, and I think that's, that's especially true here in, in Alaska and in, and in Wyoming. Um, you, you know, one of the things that we've really looked at, and, and, and I would encourage you all to, you've heard it over and over again from me, um, we have a climate challenge. Um, it is carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, we have carbon in the ground that's a resource, and there is a notion that says, let's just leave it there. Um, but this is a resource that research at our uh, university is demonstrating that you can actually make really lighter building materials that are more resilient and stronger, um, that, that can be transported more easily. Uh, there are ways that we can turn coal into long fiber uh, carbon chains that can be used for wings. So my hope would be that instead of Boeing uh, looking somewhere else, that they would look inside uh, the, the country and say, where can we get a resource which doesn't have the volatility of natural gas, which we can produce wings over a long period of time that can help reduce the amount of jet travel uh, or jet, carbon dioxide from jet travel uh, because we make a lighter plane. So, so we're really in all hands on deck. We have something called the Integrated Test Center, uh, the ITC that's associated with Basin Electric, where we're really looking for things uh, to do with carbon dioxide. Fascinating stuff. We can do pharmaceuticals. We can put it in algae and make biodiesel. We have so many opportunities with what we can do. We sewed up a, a carbon X prize uh, using coal to find better uses for that. We're also looking at ways that, as I said, we can integrate carbon capture and sequestration uh, into forest management in a way that's carbon negative uh, so that we actually formally address, not just change the production and lower the amount of new CO2 that is being uh, produced, but actually take it out of the atmosphere. So as you, as you have a chance to look around, same pro-business environment, same investment in America, the same very strong uh, can-do attitude that you have here in Alaska. Take a look at Wyoming, too. Thank you, governors, and, and I, I really ap appreciate all of that. <clears throat> if there are questions in the audience, um, we can get some, some mics. I, I see that there's a question. And if you could um, introduce yourself and, and what fund you are with, uh, the audience would appreciate that. Hi, good morning. My name is Ahmed Bistaki from the Kuwait Investment Authority. Firstly, I want to thank Angela for getting us here. So you've increased the number of unique visitors first time. And I want to thank Mayor Wendell for hosting us in your beautiful city. It's lovely. And Governor um, Den Dunlevy, sorry. Um, thank you very much for having us in Alaska. It's a two-part question involving both of you both your states. Firstly, is a warming Arctic the next gold rush? And how do you make money out of it? Number two, both Wyoming and Alaska have a huge amount of land, albeit it's federal, but you still have that. It's a competitive advantage. On Tuesday, we heard an excellent presentation by Indigo, which talks about agriculture. Agriculture is the least innovative, technological innovative sector. How can you marry your compat comp competitive advantage land with an emergent technologies in agriculture? 
Thank you. So uh, the Arctic warming, it's, uh, it's definitely a, an advantage to the United States and Alaska. It's going to cut transport costs, if it warms in the manner that some have projected, transport costs to, uh, to Asia, Japan, China, East Asia, uh, dramatically. Uh, in Alaska is right there. You know, I was joking around with uh, a new friend I met from Panama who runs the Panama um, Fund that uh, we're going to give a Panama a run for its money. And um, with the warming of the Arctic, that would happen. And um, it would also open up new areas of exploration within the Arctic Ocean and on the shores of the Arctic Ocean for research. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was we also have, I think we're one of the only states that has its own uh, private missile launch, rocket launch uh, uh, institution set up. We actually launch rockets. We just launched an Israeli satellite here just a couple weeks ago. Um, so our proximity to the poles, our proximity to the Arctic Ocean um, is absolutely, uh, I think, an advantage. And that's something that people in this room and this world should think about because we need to build infrastructure in that area. We need to start to develop that area in anticipation of what's going to happen. Uh, and in going to farming, we have a very, very, very small farming sector in the state of Alaska, but we do grow barley. We do grow vegetables. We can grow meat, cattle, et cetera, in the state of Alaska, and we do. Um, what, we are, what we are fighting off, and some of you have probably heard this term, and um, we are definitely going to do everything we can to move in this direction, is um, we've got a little bit of a case of Dutch disease in Alaska when it comes to focus solely on resources and oil. But the future, when you look at it in terms of agriculture, we have enormous amounts of land. We have, in some areas of the state, uh, you'll have 22 hours of daylight throughout the summer, and it still will be 70, 80, 90 degrees temperature for that three-month period. So we can grow a lot of uh, uh, crops and root crops, et cetera, for export. So that's certainly something that can happen. But I believe, again, our proximity. I believe, again, what's happening in the Arctic. Uh, again, our, our newness as a state, I think, bodes well for those that want to get in on the ground floor of investment. Um, and again, it is America, so uh, I think all those things combined um, uh, really bodes well for this country um, and our state. I haven't really uh, thought that much about how uh, warming of the Arctic would necessarily benefit Wyoming other than to be able to open up uh, perhaps some different routes for our, for our commodities going going elsewhere, uh, which, you, you know, as I remember Auckland, we talked a lot about how we can develop mutually beneficial infrastructure. So I, I think that's something sovereigns can do where the professional investing groups might not be as, as, as skilled at that. Um, but, but I think you know, when you're talking about agriculture and the opportunities in Indigo is very exciting. Uh, you know, here I think there's a general fluency uh, about what agriculture can provide that Indigo is starting to help elevate in the public conversation. Uh, it, it's incredibly important. As I said, uh, we, uh, I run a, a cattle ranch, and uh, the process of managing the cattle actually improved the organic content in our soil over about 46,000 acres, uh, which is why we got those metric tons sequestered. And, and we're getting a certain amount of payment over time to maintain that. Uh, so, you know, these are social costs um, that, that should be addressed somehow. And normally, the way we ex do that exchange might be monetary. But now with the advent of blockchain and, and maybe some of the cryptos and particularly the tokenization that we have in Wyoming, you know, maybe there are other forms of settlement that can be beneficial because in this, in this conversation about how we're driving from the rural to the urban centers, urban centers now have the ability to say, oh my gosh, you know, the water cycle is much improved because of the, of the management we're seeing. We're going to reward farmers that stay on the land with that. And maybe we don't have to do that with a monetary payment. Maybe we'll do that with tokenization. So I think there are some real opportunities looking forward uh, that, that, that really begin to marry both the urban and the rural interface in a way that's beneficial for the world. I think we have time for um, 
one or two more questions if we have some in the audience. In the back, in the far back. Hi, Paul Clements Hunt from the Blended Capital Group. Uh, Angela, Governors, thanks for a great conversation. Um, but my takeaway fundamentally was in terms of the challenges we have ahead, globally or at the state level, we've got to cross the aisle. That's a, a takeaway. We've got to have new forms of collaboration to make markets work more efficiently. Okay. Um, in essence, we need a new form of political economy. We have to get away from the left-right divide. How do we work more effectively for our communities? Now, I wouldn't want to preach in the US the, uh, the benefits of Adam Smith, so the, the wealth of nations. But seven years before the wealth of nations, he uh, wrote the theory of moral sentiments, which is you need that component to underpin markets. So my question is, what role should sovereign wealth funds with their power and reach play in remaking political economy so we make the markets work effectively and responsible, uh, responsibly for all our communities in terms of jobs and livelihoods, but that long-term patient capital, how can they help remake political economy? Boy, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you're, you, I think you need to have the dialogue with politicians um, as to what the decisions or potential decisions made politically, what impacts and ramifications they're going to have on your funds and your ability to invest, your, your ability to, uh, to create wealth within your fund for your uh, clients, your customers. Um, you know, the, the, when you were speaking, the point that came up for myself is that we oftentimes do get locked down as politicians on a, um, a win-lose situation, competing with our competitors, um, we can take it to a level sometimes that can be extreme, but having dialogue, you interjecting dialogue and conversation about how decisions by investors um, can be changed or impacted both negatively and positively by what happens in the political realm, I think is very important. Um, I think it does give uh, politicians uh, at times a moment to reflect as to whether if we're going down a certain avenue in a certain manner, um, whether the outcomes that the politician is looking at is an outcome that benefits not just the fund, but the greater state or the greater country or the greater world. Um, but I think that dialogue is important. How you do it and in what realm or what location or what country or state you're in, um, you're going to probably have to uh, 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 meld your approach to the political realities of where you're at. But I would say, generally speaking, um, I know I do, and I know a lot of other governors uh, listen to when investors are saying, if these conditions exist, it makes us difficult to invest and create wealth. But if these conditions existed, we could probably create wealth in this manner. Those, uh, those, those methods and those approaches to communication, I think, are valuable and need to happen. I think it's a very thought-provoking question that you've asked, and my, my immediate answer to that is I don't think the IFSWF or the community of sovereign wealth funds would, would be well advised to try to uh, influence political discourse. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because uh, that was sort of the reason why this, this uh, body came together in the first place. There was real concern. There was such wealth amassed here that it would start to influence the outcomes. But I do think when you look at what the Santiago principles provided, uh, it was a guidance about transparency. Uh, and, and I know for us, um, a couple years ago, we were recognized as the third most transparent behind New Zealand and Norway. And, y y you know, that helped to bring a certain amount of pride to our fund and our fund's management that, that politicians respected. I think politicians by nature have a very short-term 
uh, horizon. And, and, and sovereign funds, by nature, have a very long-term horizon, or at least should have. So I come back to saying, you, you know, are there principles? Are there principles that you could call the Juno principles that really talk about, uh, you know, how we invest uh, for good? You know, there's some talk about uh, renewable standards and all that. I hope I've made the case about the issue being about carbon and management going forward. But, but I think there are opportunities to really talk about guidance on, on disruption. I made the point yesterday about Uber. Uber was supposed to be this, um, you know, an amazing thing that was going to bring in a new, uh, a new world. And yet the issues that have been brought up over the last year are old world issues. What's my pension? How come I'm not getting paid? Top management gets paid too much. So these are things that, that are going to keep reemerging, and I think sovereigns have that perspective to be able to help guide that uh, direction going forward. Well, governors, I want to thank you. We're, we're out of time today. This has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your candidness and your willingness to share with all of us. Um, your time today and your thoughts on these many important topics. And so with that, I would like you all to give a warm thank you uh, to both of you.